Right, hello. So uh, um, this uh, presentation is to provide some feedback for the chemical oceanography part of the oceanography course, uh, specifically the exam. So the reason I'm doing this is to hopefully uh, this will enable you to get feed well, get feedback to a wider range of, of you guys because um, there's 120 people on the course. But that's not to say I'm not willing to see individuals on a one-to-one -one basis about any things they don't understand from the course or from uh, the exam and I believe there'll be a feedback session organized by the teaching office as well. So to start with uh, I thought I'd just you know to maybe put your results in context this is the mark distribution unmoderated um, so this is not the final mark distribution of uh, my part of the, the, the course just the exam um, so you can see there's quite a broad distribution. Um, some people did very well, some people did not so well. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to see from this that almost everybody can uh, has some room for improvement. Um, and if you did particularly badly, you're not you know you're not you're not you're not on your own. Um, so um, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, this being a reflection on your kind of. Uh, qualities as a person if you've, uh, if you've not performed amazingly on this course so far. Um, but anyway, I thought I'd just show this to, to give you a kind of put your results in, in some kind of context. Um, so also I thought I'd just give a bit of advice more generally about um, of how exam questions tend to work at university. Um, and this is an example that I think was posted on the Facebook group just after the exam. I've uh, anonymized it to to kind of uh, to share the poster, um, any uh, emotions, but you know, if we have a, an exam question that asks, "What is ice rafted debris?" I mean, an answer that says it is debris that rifts on ice. On ice. I mean, that is technically a correct answer, but uh, is it all the answer that we can give? So, I guess I mean, an answer that you can give may not be the full answer. So, with university questions, we're quite often asking. Um, we, we, we definitely ask a specific question for which we want a specific response, but we also expecting you to expand on that answer and provide uh, relevant details. So um, when I say that, I don't mean waffle on endlessly about uh, anything, but in this specific place, we say, what is ice rafted debris? Well, it is debris that rafts on ice, but what kind of ice? Is it sea ice? Is it icebergs? Um, where is the ice? Is it in rivers? Is it in lakes? Is it in the ocean? Uh, what kind of thing is the debris? Is it uh, organic debris? Is it uh, volcanic debris? Is it uh, continentally derived debris? Is it windblown debris? Um, all of these things would provide a much more detailed answer that is relevant to the question. Okay, and I'll, I'll let you decide what the what a potentially a better part answer to that question would have been. Um, so importantly, do not answer a question that you make up because if you don't just because you don't know the specific answer that we're asking you, what we're not going to give you a lot of credit for is answering a question that you know the answer to but is not the specific question. Um, and we'll come on to some examples of that uh, as we move on through the presentation. So Moving on to the chemistry part of the course, so the, the, the format was there were two short questions which you had to answer both, and then there was a choice of two longer format questions. So looking at the two short ones first, if we just look at these in turn. Um, so first of all, the first question, so what are the major conservative constituents of salt in the ocean, and why is the ocean saltier than rivers? So the first thing to do when you get a question, like this or any question, is to try and split it up and find out how you're going to answer it. So the thing I would do is I'd split this question into two parts. So what are the major components of salt? And then why is the ocean salty? Um, and then once you've done that, you might want to go further and identify the key terms in those questions to determine what is specifically being asked of you. So in the case of the first what are the major conservative constituents? So we're basically looking for a list of the major constituents of sea salt, okay? Um, and specifically, these. Okay, so just writing down this list, sodium, chlorine, sulfate, magnesium, and potassium, uh, that would get you 
marks. What would not get you marks is writing down things that are the non-conservative elements, so things like carbonate, nitrate, the nutrients, oxygen, silicon. So these are all things that are dissolved in seawater, but um, they don't con comprise the conservative components. Similarly, you shouldn't write down kind of the minor components because we're, the question specifically asks for the majors. So things like iron, mercury, zinc, aluminium, they are dissolved in seawater, but they are neither major nor conservative. So um, you need to be very careful to specifically answer the question that is asked. Okay. Also, don't answer a question that is um, one that you know the answer to, but one that is not being asked. So in this case, you could have spent a long time describing and defining what a conservative element is, perhaps defining what a residence time is. That's not relevant to the, well, it's relevant, but it's not specifically what we're asking, okay? So it would have been okay to write this stuff down. You wouldn't have lost marks for it, but you wouldn't have gained many marks for it. It would be very inefficient use of your time. Moving on to the second part of this, this question, why is the ocean salty? Well, you can ask yourself, where do the salts come from? Okay, and then you could list some sources, weathering, volcanism, hydrothermal vents. And then you could say, why do the salts end up in the ocean? Okay, so the key part answer to this question is that when water evaporates from the ocean, the water is evaporated, but the salt is left behind, is not evaporated. And then you could take that a little bit further and say, as that water is recycled through the water cycle, every time it goes over the land, it you know, causes a small amount of weathering that removes salt from the land into the oceans. Okay, And then you could also expand further and say you know, the salt is very soluble in water, so that means that its concentration can be very high in the ocean, so it can accumulate there. And you might want to um, use a diagram like this. It's not entirely essential for such a short question like this, but this is the kind of thing we're, 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 we're talking about here. So water comes down in the rivers, the blue arrow, and is recycled through evaporation and precipitation a lot. Uh, but the salts only really move from the land to the ocean. There's a very small return flux through um, dust and through um, evaporite deposition and poor water burial. Um, so uh, this is this is the key diagram that explains the answer to the, the question. So I was talking earlier about expanding on your answer. So to really get the top marks for questions like this, just saying the answer, just that list of things, isn't isn't sufficient. So uh, we could think about you know saying that though listing that list of elements, but saying that sodium and chlorine are the most dominant components, and also composing that these are dissolved ions and not minerals. So uh, salt isn't made of sodium chloride, it's made of, well, the dissolved ions in ocean, it's not made of sodium chloride, it's made of sodium and chloride ions. And then in the why is the ocean salty part, we could expand that on saying why salt is soluble in the ocean. So what is it the properties of water that allow it to hold a lot of salt? Um, and also why are the removal processes and why are they so slow? So things like why I mean, this, this feeds into the wire salt, so soluble as well. Okay, so moving on to the second question, which was um, about the how nutrients are taken up during photosynthesis. So once again, split this into two parts. So the first part is, is basically asking you to write a reaction, okay, that summarizes the uptake of nutrients. Okay, and then the second part is is other than the, okay, we just pick out the, um, the key um, uh, uh, phrases in that question. So we want a balanced reaction. It must involve nutrients and it must be describing photosynthesis. And then the second part of the question is basically now asking you to, to, to list uh, nutrients other than the major nutrients that are thought to limit life in the ocean. Okay, so the thing is, other than major nutrients, what limits life in the ocean? And it's and it's asking you for a list of four. So with the this is kind of really telling you um, here that you know, what we want is a list of four things. Um, okay, so for the first part of that question, I mean, very simply, this there's this equation. You write down this equation as it is written here. You get lots and lots of marks. Um, 
the important things that I was looking for in this equation is basically to show that we've worked with this is nitrate and phosphate here. So the, the equation is taking up nitrate and phosphate. It's taking it up in a ratio for 106 carbons, 16 nitrogens, and one phosphate. Okay. Other important things are this requires the sun's energy. The reaction only goes one way, and that's kind of important. Okay, so photosynthesis is not an equilibrium reaction that can go backwards and forwards. Okay, uh, uh, the nitrate and phosphate are converted into these forms over here. So these it's formed into organic forms of, of nitrogen and phosphate. So these this is not organic. This is not the equation for organic nitrogen, and this is not the equation for organic phosphorus, but it's kind of chemically equivalent. Uh, and the other thing is that we produce oxygen, okay, and the equation should, should, should balance as well. So you get all of that right, you get a whole bunch of marks. Okay, the second part of the question was, was universally answered quite poorly, and I think it was somewhat mis misread, but Specifically, I'm asking, other than the major nutrients, what other elements are thought to limit life in the ocean? So the key here is other than major nutrients. So if you wrote down nitrate, phosphate, silicate, these are major nutrients. So these are not part of the answer. Okay? They may well limit life in the oceans, but that is not what the question is asking. So specifically, the question is asking you for the list for elements that that are not major nutrients that limit life in the oceans. There's things like micronutrients, so just an example from the lecture, iron, manganese, zinc, cadmium, selenium, molybdenum, vanadium, nickel, and copper are elements which are essential for life but are, exist in very low concentrations in the ocean. Okay. Additionally, you could also write down some things that limit life due to their toxicity. So if you have too much of these things, then uh, say mercury, cadmium, lead, for instance, um, that would also limit the the, the, the success of life. Okay, so this was a little bit harder to expand your answer um, uh, because it's asking a very specific question, but you could have, for, for instance, you know, said what are the micronutrients used for? You know, what um, molecules are they used for? For instance, iron is used in um, uh, enzymes that perform nitrogen fixation. Uh, why are the elements toxic that are toxic? Um, and you might, for the equation, you might want to point out that the ratio of uptake, this 106, 16 to 1, is only an average. So the redfield ratio is an average for the ocean, but there are spatial variabilities. So that's how you could have kind of scored very highly on those, those first two questions. Okay, so moving on to the longer questions. So the first one was asking basically about uh, the oxygen profile in the ocean. So I've split this question up into three parts. So the first part is basically just asking you, you should draw a diagram. I mean, it's just when a question says, with the aid of a diagram, if you don't draw a diagram, then you're in trouble. Um, the second part is basically saying you must describe, I think I've, okay, yeah, put this there. Describe processes that determine the typical ox oxygen concentration profile in the open ocean. So we're looking for a diagram of a depth profile of oxygen that that illustrates processes that, that occur to control the concentration profile. And then the last part of this question is basically asked you to compare what a profile would look like in the equatorial Pacific Ocean from the North Atlantic Ocean. And the key parts are here are the equatorial Pacific and the central North Atlantic. Um, and we'll come on to why those areas are, that is important um, in a bit. Okay, so this is this is a diagram that, that you might want to have drawn for this, this type of question. So these are actually two real profiles, one from the eastern equatorial Pacific, one from the North Atlantic. Um, so I wouldn't have expected you to, to accurately um, known exactly what these profiles look like, so uh, it's kind of a, a, a sketch that has the, the correct um, broad shape and the kind of the, the the correct relative kind of concentrations between the two profiles. So things your your sketch things would have it should have labelled axes, depth, and oxygen concentrations. Uh, if you're able to remember what the oxygen concentrations are in the ocean, that would be a good thing to pop on. Uh, uh, and actually, annotating the diagram is a really efficient way 
of, of writing down your answer. So for instance, if you were to write a bunch of labels on here that or pointed in a little, little, little arrow, maybe to, to here that with a process that said, I don't know, respiration causing an oxygen minimum zone, that would save you from writing down a whole paragraph about respiration causing an oxygen minimum zone. Very efficient way of providing an answer. Um, so looking at that second part, um, describing the processes that determine that, that typical oxygen concentration profile in the ocean. So this is another um, uh, example of, a, of an oxygen concentration profile. This one is from, from the lectures. And you can see it has the same kind of thing. In this case, it has an expanded surface layer. It has a maximum at about 100 meters. And then it goes on to an oxygen minimum at about 1,000 meters, and then an increase to deeper water. Okay, So we can see here that the, the process is going on at the very, very surface. We have exchange with the atmosphere, Okay, and that can be explained by Henry's law. So there's a temperature dependence to that. Uh, and then at uh, a shallow depth, we have a maximum of uh, photosynthesis producing oxygen, and then uh, a greater depth in the ocean, organic matter sinking down, sinking down from this level down to this level where it's respired. Okay, there's no photosynthesis going on at this depth because we've run out of light, um, and that respiration is using up oxygen. Okay, reducing the concentration, and then in the very deep ocean, the oxygen concentration is determined by the advection of deep water masses. Okay, so those deep water masses are coming from somewhere else that have. Uh, an initially higher oxygen concentration. Okay, and then looking on to the last part of that question, how might these concentration profiles be different? So there are kind of two parts to this, this answer. Okay, we can divide it up into really the deep ocean. Okay, so the deep water differences. So you can see the Atlantic over here has a higher concentration than the Pacific. And that's that's just due to the, the age of the water masses in the deep ocean. So the Pacific is a long way further around on that, the global um, deep water ocean conveyor. So it's had more chance to have organic matter fall into that and be respired and using up the oxygen that's in that water. Okay. And then the other part is about the shallow water. So looking up in kind of this part of the, the water column, and the differences there are... First of all, um, temperature. So the, the Pacific has got a lower concentration than the Atlantic in the very surface water, and that's simply due to the temperature. So the Atlantic is colder than the Pacific, so more oxygen can dissolve in the water. Okay, the other differences here are due to differences in the uh, biological productivity in these two regions, which are in turn determined by the physical oceanography. So the equ equatorial Pacific, because it's on the equator, experiences upwelling, so there's more biological productivity. Okay, that biological productivity may cause there to be slightly more oxygen produced by that photosynthesis at about 60 to 100 meters, but it will also produce a lot of organic matter, and that organic matter will sink and it will be respired. So for that reason, we have this large decrease in oxygen concentration in the Pacific, and that's because this is a much more biologically productive region. So organic matter and oxygen are being produced in the surface ocean, but in, as in the moving to the deeper ocean, it's being much, much um, uh, reduced because of all the organic matter being produced. Okay, so that's kind of what it says there. Okay, so we might expand on that answer some, some more. Okay, so we might want to talk about how potentially the density stratification, so I mean, for the, the case of describing the open ocean, why we're able to have a high gradient in oxygen concentration. So why the, the surface ocean can have a high concentration of oxygen, whereas below the thermocline, okay, we can get very, very low concentrations of oxygen. So the density stratification can play a role. We might want to talk about why the deep water has got high oxygen. Okay, and that's usually because it's formed at high latitudes where it's cold and more oxygen can dissolve in the water. Um, we might want to talk about some of the reasons why the photosynthesis peak is not at the surface. Okay, why don't we get maximum photosynthesis at the surface? Um, and there are reasons for that uh, written down here. So we've got the, the, 
actually the supply of nutrients to the surface layer is actually from mixing from below so we get a maximum of biological activity at the base of the mix layer and also in some regions there's too much light so our, uh, all the phytoplankton basically get sunburnt uh, so they actually prefer to live at a little bit of depth in the ocean okay and the other things you might want to talk about kind of looking at relating this question to maybe other parts of the course is how does the physical oceanography um, change the, the concentration profile. So for instance in the Equatorial Pacific we've got upwelling, okay that might cause the oxygen minimum zone to be slightly higher in the water column um, compared to uh, the North Atlantic which is in the center of a gyre so we have convergence of water um, due to Ekman pumping, uh, well Ekman pumping due to Ekman transport sorry which converges the water um, and that, that inhibits um, mixing from uh, the deep ocean, so that means there's less biological productivity in the North Atlantic. So we could we could we could add these these things in, but kind of really concentrate on getting the basics down first. Okay, and so finally, the 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 fourth question. Not many people answered the fourth question, um, which hopefully that means. I mean, partially because I think there was quite a lot of discussion on the online forum which was relevant for the third question, but, but uh, not for the fourth question. So hopefully that means that you guys were all busy reading stuff on the online forum. Uh, but anyway, the, so the fourth question is about, is about mercury and its toxicity. So this is basically relating to the last lecture. So once again, we can split the question. So the first part of the question is asking for what are the main natural and anthropogenic sources of mercury? Okay, so we're looking for basically a list of natural sources and a list of anthropogenic sources. The second part is, is asking us about the environmental hazard mercury um, uh, poses. So we're, we're, we're basically, what are the controls on the environmental hazard of mercury? What are the processes involved in that? And how are those affected by basically the environment? First part of that question, natural and anthropogenic. So very simply, if we have natural sources, volcanic gases, weathering, those provide, um, well, they introduce mercury into the environment. The anthropogenic sources, gold mining, okay, so mining waste, um, coal burning, actually one of the, the major sources uh, currently, and uh, the chloralkali process, which I went over in the lecture. So basically industrial uh, processes which which waste from those can can add mercury to the environment and this this last one is the kind of the example of the um, chemical weapons factory in Kazakhstan Ooh. okay so <clears throat> looking at the second part of that question we're basically looking at you know, what controls the environmental hazard so I mean first of all it's to note that mercury is very toxic okay okay in all forms but different forms of mercury have different kind of toxicities so native mercury mercury with no charge in it so this is basically the, the silvery liquid that silvery liquid this one this has is the least toxic and then as we move towards the right over here through um, inorganic mercuries to organic mercuries this oxidation uh, results in in forms of mercury that are both more toxic and also more soluble, okay? And, and an increased solubility also means that it's more mobile in the environment, okay? So if we go to these methyl mercuries and dimethyl mercuries, these are the worst, okay? So the hazard is also increased by increasing the, the concentration of these, uh, of these uh, chemical species of mercury, and that can be done through processes such as bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Okay, so this is also a good example of where you can end up kind of going off uh, down a little bit of a wrong route when answering a question like this. So if you read the question, we're not asking why mercury is toxic, okay? We are asking what controls its um, environmental hazard. So you could have written a lot about why mercury is toxic, it replaces selenium, it inhibits a whole bunch of biological functions, but that is not what's controlling the hazard, okay? Um, so uh, it, by going off down that route, you may have um, wasted some of your time.
Okay, so you can go on into some of the things, the processes and the biochemical conditions that control the uh, the environmental hazards. So these are basically what is controlling what chemical species of mercury we have. Okay, and that's whether we have an oxic or an anoxic condition. Okay, the sedimentation rate can can determine how much mercury stays in the environment. Okay, so that if we have a high rate of sedimentation, we'll be burying the mercury, we'll be reducing the environmental hazard. Okay, and some of the chemical processes that are occurring, so things like oxidation or reduction, we start to reduce our mercury, that moves it into those less toxic forms, we oxidize it, it moves us into the more toxic forms. Methylation, which is kind of the formation of organic mercuries, that increases the environmental hazard and processes such as photodegradation, so which is when these organic mercuries get into the, the surface ocean, sunlight can break them down into less toxic forms. So those would all be good things to have written down um, if you were asking, answering this question. Okay, so this is the kind of the kind of diagram that you might have wanted to, to use to to help illustrate your answer. It wouldn't be an essential, but this is from the lecture, kind of illustrating a whole bunch of different processes, how different forms of mercury are are converted from one to another by um, biochemical processes. Okay, so you, if we think about how we could take that answer a little bit further, okay, so we could have for the sources we could have we could have noted you know which were the most important sources, which are the biggest, how they've changed through time, so how anthropogenic sources have increased, okay, how the burning of coal has increased, and that's now the dominant source of mercury to the uh, environment. Okay, we could have uh, we could write down some of the equations for chemical processes. That's I mean that goes for almost all answers in a chemical oceanography course. If you can expand your answers with some chemistry, that would also be super. Um, and um, you know, adding details about some of the the biology that's happening as well might have been quite useful. Okay, so to summarise, I mean I think you could maybe hopefully answer this question now. You know, could you think? Do you think you could have done better? Hopefully, you'll see now that there are areas where you can have definitely improved on some of your exam answers for this specific course. But hopefully, apply some of the techniques and of, of reading a question, splitting it up um, to other exams. So, I kind of this little uh, diagram uh, of what you should be thinking about when you when you first kind of open your exam papers so always always read the question okay and really try and identify what is specifically being asked I mean this could be you know, writing down a few notes uh, in your answer book you know you don't have to rewrite the whole question just notes that what are the words that you would circle on the um, on the exam paper okay if appropriate split up the question into different parts okay uh, if you do do that, always remember that you still have to answer all parts of the question. Okay, and then a good bit of advice is to always leave space after each question so you can then come back once you've written at least something for all of the questions that you have to and add those expanding parts of the questions where you, or parts of the answers where you can really fill in and kind of boost your marks up from kind of a... Uh, a two-one to a kind of a first-class kind of answer that has lots and lots of uh, detail and relevant um, kind of uh, explanations. Okay, so hopefully uh, you guys have found this uh, useful. Um, once again, uh, I think I'm, I'm still happy to answer the questions uh, at the feedback session or um, other methods um, and hopefully uh, you found the course interesting and uh, informative uh, hopefully you made use of some of the stuff on learn and the discussion forum some of the videos and stuff um, but anyway so this was the um, this was the feedback session so um, not the session this was the feedback kind of presentation so um, please remember that you've had uh, some feedback okay Okay, so the feedback loop. So feedback does kind of go on forever. So uh, this is the first time that I've uh, done a kind of a feedback video slash presentation thing. Um, so if you found this useful um, and want it to be done again in other courses, even if I'm not going to give you any more, if I'm not teaching you any more courses, um, if you tell people that this was useful, uh, more other uh, lecturers are more likely to do it. Um, so if you've enjoyed or found this feedback useful, um, feel free 
to tell people about it, either uh, me or um, the relevant uh, teaching office type people that, hey, there was this really good feedback uh, method that we had for oceanography. Uh, I wish more people would use that. Okay, so if you liked it, if you want it to happen again, um, you need to tell people about it. Okay, thank you.